Hey everyone, uh, happy new year and welcome to our first National Sewing Circle live event for 2018. Of course, we have Nikki LaFoyle here to answer all of your sewing questions. Thanks so much for being here, Nikki. Glad to be back. Perfect. All right, we're gonna start right off with some questions that we got pre-submitted here, um, which is always an option to pre-submit questions, but if you are new to tuning into uh, our live events, maybe it's your New Year's resolution to learn some more about sewing, uh, you can ask questions live for the next hour by typing those into the comment section below the video, and we'll work our way through as many questions as we possibly can. So our first question here says, if using the walking foot on my machine, can I still use the fancy stitches listed under the quilting options of my computerized sewing machine, such as the serpentine stitch, or is it only for straight stitches, even if the foot has a large opening um, as other specialty feet have? Well, I have not uh, tried this myself, but looking on patternreview.com and looking at forums, uh, of this question, people say yes, they use their walking foot with zigzag stitches and with decorative stitches as long as the opening of the foot, as mentioned in the question, as long as the opening of the foot is wide enough to accommodate the, the side to side motion of the stitch. So I would say if you want to try it, uh, choose your stitch and just walk the hand wheel a little bit to make sure that the widest parts of the stitch. Uh, will stay within uh, the opening of the foot so that you don't hit your needle on the foot and break your needle and or the foot. Perfect. Absolutely. Just sort of a, a follow up to that. Have you ever had any issue doing extensive back stitching with a walking foot? I guess I've only ever done, you know, maybe one or two to start and stop a stitch. Right. Um, that would be the other thing. Um, I don't think just I haven't tried it, but just from a functional knowledge of the way a walking foot works, um, I would not do a lot of back stitching. Like you said, just one or two to lock the stitch, maybe. But uh, try not to choose a decorative stitch that has a lot of back and forth motion. I think side to side is fine, like a zigzag stitch, but the the back and forth motion may. Um, may gum things up since the way the walking foot works is for every stitch you take it's trying to pull that upper layer of fabric through so if you're trying to it might you know you're, you have opposing forces there so um, yeah that is the one caveat there I would say um, choose your decorative stitch so that you don't have a lot of backward motion perfect all right, our next one here, when sewing baby bibs, can you have one side a terry cloth or cotton while the other side is some sort of bubble microfiber fleece fabric? And if yes, what type of thread and sewing needle is recommended? Yes, absolutely you can. And it's funny that that description of the fleece fabric, I know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> it's that um, it looks almost like polka dot, except the polka dot is actually like stamped into the fleece. And I've always called it cuddle fabric, but is there another name? Is that the actual name for it? Um, I don't know if or that's- Or minky, right? Minky fabric? Minky, I think minky has a lot of other types okay. of fleece, you know, really soft fabric as well. So I don't I don't know if that's the, the actual name of the fabric. I like the, the bubble- The bubble microfiber, I like that too, yeah. <laughs> uh, but in answer to the question, yes, you absolutely can sew a bib and it's a really good idea to have the soft fleece against the baby and have the the terry cloth out to catch all the mess it's it's a, a great design idea um, and as far as needles and thread to use I'd say all-purpose thread great for most of your sewing needs um, and for the needle uh, this is one of those situations where you're sewing a woven, the terry cloth is woven, and the fleece is a knit. So sewing a, a knit to a woven, um, you, you want to uh, err on the side of caution. So the fabric that needs any sort of special considerations, you want to go with that. So uh, when you're sewing any knit fabric, I always recommend sewing with a ballpoint needle. Um, or a jersey needle or a stretch needle. They're all uh, the same sort of construction in the needle type. Instead of a really pointed tip, the tip is sort of rounded so that 
instead of piercing the fibers of the fabric, it'll kind of nestle in between, uh, uh, in between the weave to minimize tearing of the fibers and minimize the possibility of getting a run in your fabric. Um, so I would say use one of those ballpoint needles just to, to save your, um, any possible damage to the knit fabric that you're sewing. And a ballpoint needle will work just fine on the woven terry cloth fabric. Um, you would just not want to use a ballpoint needle sewing something like a denim, something that has a really dense weave, like a twill weave, um, like a, a, a denim or a canvas. So ballpoint needle, all purpose thread, have at it. Now does fleece, I know fleece is a really easy fabric to work with in terms of um, it's, you know, soft, easy, cut up, easy to cut out, all that kind of thing. Uh, does it dull your needle though pretty quickly when you're sewing on it? Yeah, fleece is one of those fabrics um, in addition to felt and leather um, that will dull your needle pretty quickly. So if, um, if you're using it for a while, I would say um, change it quicker than you would change you know, a needle if you were just sewing on cotton fabric. So generally they say change your needle for every six to eight hours of sewing time. If you got to that point of sewing on fleece or felt or something like that, um, your needle will probably be pretty dull. So I'd say, you know, four hours of sewing time or something like that. But I always, I actually just sewed a project using felt and it was, I don't know, an hour or two max of sewing time, but I just I just threw the needle away after I was done using it. Um, that's that is what helps me remember to change my needle is after each project, um, I will I'll change out my needle unless it was like you know something really short, like a half hour of sewing time on the needle, then I'll stick it back in my in my sewing box with a little note on. How much time I I sewed with it on but yes that is a good point if you're sewing like a fleece blanket something really big um, your needle might get dull pretty quickly like even halfway into the project so uh, one sign of a dull needle to go on a tangent here um, a sign of a dull needle is uh, flagging against the machine bed so if your fabric starts kind of jumping up and down on your machine bed when the needle goes through it and you'll often hear a little bunk 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 noise when your needle goes through the fabric that's called flagging and that is one symptom of a dull needle um, a dull needle can also cause all manner of tension issues with um with your thread so you might get um, thread nests you might get uh, uneven tension in your stitches where at the beginning of your project, it was fine, but you know it starts to devolve when your needle gets dull. So if you run into those problems uh, and you've been sewing with your needle for a couple of hours, I'd say that's um, that would be a good guess that your needle is getting dull. Absolutely. All right, one more follow-up question, just because I recently did sew something with this bubble microfiber fleece fabric as well. Um, can you press it? Is there a way to press it without smashing the bubbles or distorting the texture that comes with the fabric, especially if you're making something like baby bibs where you may have cotton on the back and want to sort of press those seams when you turn things inside out? Um, I'm not sure. I have not myself tried pressing those, but um, to eliminate that possibility, you might try just pressing your seam open just with the tip of your iron, try to get just right along that seam. So you don't risk smashing that texture. Okay. Absolutely. All right. The next question, this is from Sarah. And she says, do you have any tips on creating wavy hems? Wavy hems. Um, like, a, like a lettuce edge, do you think? Either a lettuce edge or if you're going to have something that kind of goes like this and you're going to press it under, you have all sorts of either too little fabric, too much fabric when you're trying to say do a double fold hem or something? Um, yeah, so if you wanted to do um, a lettuce edge, just uh, a real quick note on the lettuce edge, if that is what was meant by the question. 
Um, a lettuce edge is really easy to do on a serger. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head um, any ways to do it on a regular sewing machine, but on a serger, you can adjust the differential feed to sort of stretch the fabric out as it's going um, under the under the needle, and you know your serger overcasts the edge all in one, and as it it kind of stretches that fabric out, so you get that wavy lettuce edge. Um, if you want to do a wavy edge, like almost like a scallop, sort of, but not quite, you know, the, the sharp edges of the scallop in the corner, um, and you want to hem that edge. Um, when you're folding up the fabric around a curve, so in the, 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 the hills of the curve, I guess, the, the uppermost points, when you fold that up, you're going to need to clip into um, into the fabric to allow the hem allowance to kind of spread open. Um, and in the, the valleys of the curve, the lower most par uh, points, um, you'll need to notch out that curve since the, the hem that is being folded up, you're going to have, you know, excess, excess fabric folding up into that little into the curve. So notching out some fabric will allow that to lay flat. And um, apart from that, that's like the basic um, basic of, of the, the curves, uh, curved hem. Um, I guess it would depend on exactly what you're doing with the project on how to proceed from there. Okay, well then I'm gonna throw a curveball at you just because, so my absolute favorite hem, which is funny because it drives my mom crazy, but I love to just do like a double fold hem, the most basic, yeah. easy hem. Okay, so if I'm going to notch or clip, I can do that on the first fold, but then the second fold, does the initial notching and clipping that I did still work? Or do I have to do something extra there to get that extra double fold part? Mm -hmm. To double fold, I'm not sure, a double fold would be the best option for a wavy hem. Um, if you wanted something cleaner than just, you know, a single fold and then like a zigzag, because um, that leave, does leave, would leave a lot of raw edges on the wrong side. Um, binding would be a good option, um, depending on where this edge is and what you're using it for. Um, you can also finish edges using Fold over elastic. It's really easy. Just fold it over an edge and stitch it, and it's so easy. Um, but yeah, binding might be the best way to go about that. And you'd have to use bias binding so that it would curve around those curves easily. Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Tria, and she says, I want to be able to make some loose button-up shirts, pajamas, maybe some simple dresses down the road. I know next to nothing about sewing machines, so what should I look for when buying a machine? Um, so that is um, pretty subjective, depending on what you want to do down the road. But when you're just starting out, if you want to do um, just some simple garments, uh, you don't need a whole lot in a sewing machine. Um, if you wanted to do um, quilting down the road, you may want to look for some specific quilting features on a machine. But for garments, uh, that's mostly all I sew. Um, and I used a a brother machine all through high school and college and it was just their lowest model completely you know it had the straight stitch zigzag stitch it actually had a quite a lot of built-in decorative stitches and it had buttonhole stitches built in which was the uh, the thing that you would probably want to look for if you're sewing garments buttonhole stitches are really handy to have um so I used the Brother CS6000i. I think it was maybe $250 at the most. Um, but I know they have, or was it? it? It may have been like $160 something. I can't remember. 
Um, but I, I just ordered it on Amazon and it was really easy. Um, they sell them at Walmart and all sorts of big box stores as well as brother dealers and sewing machine dealers. Um, but it had everything that I needed. It was lightweight, which was good for traveling, but it also felt lightweight when I was sewing on it, which is something that I really like about this foff. It is a little heavier duty. So when I'm sewing um, like big heavy projects on it, like sewing a full leather bag or I just hemmed a pair of denim jeans, um, it feels like it, it can stand up to whatever you want to do on it. So I love this FOF, the Passport 2.0. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than a $200 brother. Um, but if you're going to be doing a lot of garment sewing, like I do, it's absolutely worth it to have something that you can trust, that you know is going to do good work and, you know, be very precise and professional. Um, but for, for starting out and figuring out what you want to do uh, with your sewing, getting a machine that has a relatively low overhead cost is a good idea. Um, and I, you know, my generation is really easy for us to go online and read reviews on products. Um, that's what I did when I was ordering my brother. Um, but if you want to go into a sewing machine dealer and try out the machine, that will 100% give you a better idea of what you're going to be getting rather than just ordering something online sight unseen. Um, so going in and test driving some um, can never hurt. Um, but yeah, for sewing garments, straight stitch, zigzag stitch, buttonhole stitch, and that's all I have ever needed. Perfect. All right, this next question here, without the use of pre-cut patterns, what is the easiest way to cut armhole and sleeves? My sleeves are either usually wider or smaller than the armhole I'm attaching it to. Please help me. <laughs> um, so that, um, I love I love pattern drafting and pattern alterations and uh, question, answering questions about that. Unfortunately, it, it would be hard for me to you know go through a complete tutorial and show you, but if you want to draft your own bodice and sleeve pattern to fit you, um, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, I actually was just reading one from mellysews.com. Uh, Melissa Mora has a great tutorial with pictures on how to measure yourself and um, how to draw the shapes of the the bodice pattern and everything to your measurements. Um, there's also on um, threadsmagazine.com, you can search for um, how to, uh, you can search create a custom sleeve. So that is for if you have the bodice pattern and you want to create the sleeve pattern for it, um, it's a really good tutorial on how to measure the, the bodice pattern and draw your own sleeve pattern for it. But if you have a bodice pattern and a sleeve pattern already and you want to uh, make sure that they are going to fit together, there are some things that you can do. Um, you can um, uh, measure the, the seam line, first of all. Uh, making sure you're just measuring the seam line and not measuring into any of the seam allowances. And take your um, your measuring tape and put it on, on its side. So instead of measuring flat on the seam line, put it up like this and use a fabric measuring tape, not a ruler. So measure your seam line on your arm's eye and measure your seam line on your sleeve cap. Um, compare the numbers and um, you can tell if your sleeve will fit in the arm's eye and how it's going to relate. Um, <clears throat> your sleeve cap should be the size of or larger than your arm's eye. And that is called, if it's larger than your arm's eye, 
that is your sleeve cap ease. So you have a little extra uh, length in your sleeve cap to ease it into the arm's eye that gives your um, gives room in the sleeve cap for your shoulder to fit. Uh, there is some debate about how much ease is the right amount of ease for your sleeve cap. Um, commercial patterns typically have way too much ease in their sleeve cap. They put like an inch to an inch and a half of ease in the sleeve cap and I think we can all agree that that is way too much. Um, but the correct amount of ease also depends on your fabric that you're using. So if you're sewing a knit t-shirt, you don't need any ease in the sleeve cap because the knit fabrics are going to stretch and um, kind of mesh and mold together. If you are sewing something that has um, a, a little bit of a, it's, if it's a thicker fabric or has a tighter weave, you might need a little more ease um, to, to give your shoulder room and um, for, for wearing comfort. So, um, so yeah, decide how much ease you want in your sleeve cap. I would say between a quarter inch and a half inch is really a, a good rule of thumb, a good place to start. Um, but again, depends on your fabric. So um, yeah, measure your, your seam line, or you can also walk the pattern. Um, and walking the pattern just uh, is the process of laying the one of your pattern pieces down and laying the other on top of it and take, take a pin and put it through your seam line right where the seam starts so at the juncture of your seam allowances put the pin through the, the upper pattern and then place the pin on the lower pattern at the corresponding juncture and walk that seam line along so um, making sure the seam aligns and then move the pin um, to a point a little bit further down the seam and then kind of spin the upper pattern to make the seam align and walk it along like that. So um, it does the same thing as measuring the seam, but oftentimes it can be a little more accurate. Um, so those are two methods of making sure your sleeve will fit into your bodice without you know, having to draw your own pattern and everything. Perfect. Yeah, I have to say, I don't think I've ever drawn that area of a pattern ever. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> All right, next question here. This is from Mary. When you start sewing at the edge of fabric, how can I prevent the fabric from being pulled down into the machine? Yes, this, this is a typical problem, especially when you're working with thinner fabric. So something like a chiffon or even um, some slinky knit fabrics. Um, so to prevent this from happening, you can use a starter square. Uh, so start your seam on another piece of fabric and uh, then it go under the needle and under the foot and butt your project up to the edge of that and just you know, keep on sewing and then you can cut that starter square away um, afterward. You can also use a straight stitch throat plate that can help minimize that problem. Throat plate is pretty aptly named. It's just a throat plate that you can put on your machine that has just one hole rather than uh, a wider opening on the throat plate, um, which allows your needle to do wider stitches, but also has a wider opening that allows your fabric to get jammed down um, into the throat plate at times. Uh, but with the single stitch throat plate, you can only use it with your straight stitch. If you tried to sew a zigzag stitch, you would break your needle because it only has that tiny little opening. So be careful there. Um, to prevent your fabric from getting shoved down into the throat plate, you can also um, try using a little bit of tissue paper under your fabric to just give it a little bit of stability. Um, and 
yeah, that should prevent it from, from getting shoved out into the throat play, just having a little more body to that thin fabric. Absolutely. And of course, I'm sure you saved all of your tissue paper from the holidays. <laughs> you should have. I did. Yeah. So other just little note about that straight stitch throat plate, like you said, you can't do a zigzag stitch, but like depending on your machine, like my, uh, as soon as I turn my machine on, just my, the position that my needle is in is not the position that it needs to be in to use that straight stitch throat plate. Like you have to move it over. So uh, if you're not sure sort of where your machine um, starts out, so when you turn it on, like maybe just use your hand wheel and make sure you're you're lined up. So my straight stitch throat plate, uh, also my foot that also has just a little opening has a permanent needle <laughs> indentation in it because that's how I learned. <laughs> All right, our next question here, um, when Rita wants to know when machine embroidering a design onto something like a quilt block, do I need to remove the stabilizer before sewing blocks or pieces together? Um, that is a good question. Um, I have never sewn a quilt, uh, embroidered anything to, to sew into a quilt before. So actually you work a lot with quilters. I'm going to refer this to you. <laughs> so I was going to say, and I've, I've done a lot of quilting, but never any embroidering on quilting. Um, and so I would say it would depend on, I guess, how stiff you want your quilt to be. A lot of times you're going to be adding that batting between your layers with your quilt anyway. So if you're going to use a really high loft batting and you want it to be pretty puffy and thick anyway, I probably would not spend the time taking that stabilizer out. I would probably just leave it. Um, but yeah, if you're going to use maybe a really uh, thin, lightweight batting and you you use for some reason a really heavy stabilizer, then maybe, maybe get rid of it. But I probably uh, wouldn't want to do the extra step. Of yeah. removing it but say you're going to embroider like on a pocket and then you're gonna you know somehow finish the back side of that pocket and then put the pocket on would you remove it for something like that yeah for something that you're going to see the back side of it and possibly use you know be touching the back side of it I would always remove the stabilizer um, Definitely from the outside of the stitches and sometimes even from the entire thing. So if you were stitching, embroidering on like a t-shirt and it was really lightweight and you were going to be wearing it right against your skin, I would use a probably a water soluble stabilizer to stitch the design, to lay the threads down onto the fabric and then wash it and all of the stabilizer goes away from everything. Absolutely. All right. Another um, embroidery question here. Phyllis wants to know how you keep all of your embroidery designs organized on your computer or on your machine. Um, I have not, I don't have an embroidery machine myself. Um, and the last time I used an embroidery machine was when I worked at Sew News Magazine a couple years ago. Um, but on those machines, they have, um, when you put designs on them or the designs that come, you know, preloaded onto the machine, they have folders on the, the machine that allow you to, um, to organize your designs however you want by, uh, by size or well, probably not by size because you can change the size, but by, you know, category, you can, you know, make a folder for monograms, letters, folder for, for uh, insects or animals or butterflies or you know depending on what you uh, what you embroider most you can break down your categories into um, into whatever makes the most sense to you absolutely I, I do have an embroidery machine that I probably should use more often but it did come like preloaded with a bunch of designs also and it is sort of broken down into um, floral or categories like that. There's also an option to have a little favorites folder. So if there are certain things that you use a lot, you know, you can put it in there so you know right where it's at. But yeah, definitely ways to um, pretty much anything you could do like on your desktop computer, like organizing wise, you can probably do on your embroidery machine organizing wise as well. Yeah. Yep. You can create as many folders as you want to keep everything stored neatly. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, Sally wants to know, where can I find high quality fabrics 
like the ones used to make Kate Spade and Carolina Herrera dresses. Wow. Um, I'm going to point out that I don't know who Carolina Herrera is. So if you want to <laughs> explain that too. Um, uh, designer. I've heard the name before. Um, I'm not sure what kinds of things um, they design or, you know, the feel of it. Um, but you can get fabric um, anywhere online. Um, so I guess it depends on the kind of fabric that you're looking for. Um, I always, I go on like fabric.com and we were talking last time about places to go for, for fabrics and we talked about Michael Miller um, and, you know, Cloud9 and Wyndham Fabrics and they have a lot of beautiful um, quilting cottons. Um, but if you were looking for something like some specialty fabrics, um, you would have to probably search those out, you know, use different search terms, like if you're looking for a stretch faux leather, you know, use that specific search term in Google um, to find the online sites that specialize in that kind of thing. Um, I just found, uh, if you're looking for something special like, like sequiny type fabric or are really stretchy. Um, the the website is for dance wear, so it's that kind of like ice skating uniforms, you know, really stretchy, really flashy. Um, I was looking that up um, for what were you gonna make? <laughs> a potential project is going to make a skirt a really fun, flashy like New Year's thing. Um, it's just just an idea I was sketching up. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to look up the website because it's not on the top of my head, but it, I had a lot of fun just like looking through all those different fabrics. Um, so if you're, yeah, if you're looking for something specialty like that, I think I found that website using the search term, um, like stretch sequin fabric or something. So be really specific in your search terms and, um, you know, the internet is a wonderful place. Perfect. All right. And here, this is from Lori. And she says, how do you store your patterns? Any favorite tricks? Um, my patterns, I always try to fold them up as best I can um, and shove them back in the pattern envelope. <laughs> and my pattern envelope usually winds up being huge. Um, that's how I, how I typically do it. But if... Um, if I have traced the pattern off and altered it at all, I'll, I'll keep the original, but then I'll have this extra pattern, typically on butcher paper. So I try to fold that up as best I can, and I use um, folders, like just the file folders that you used in high school and college, just the two pocket things, and I keep those in there, and um, I'll put the pattern envelope in there as well. Um, I haven't had to do that a lot, but um, if I have a lot of materials to keep, like a lot of different, you know, patterns that I traced off and altered from that one pattern, I'll try to keep them all together. And I do that in file folders. You can also um, take everything and put it in a Ziploc bag and either store the Ziploc bag somewhere in a box, however you do it, however your system is set up, or you can punch a little hole up near the top and thread that through a hanger and hang it up. Um, I had my sewing room in my old house was just a guest bedroom. So I had the whole closet and I wasn't keeping anything on the rods, the hanging rods. So that was really useful for me to hang um, my patterns up in Ziploc bags and just have them all hanging in a row. I love that idea. I actually, use Ziploc bags. I never thought of hanging them, but just because I, there's no way I can fold the pattern back up and get it in the envelope. But I like to keep the envelope because I like, you know, the picture or whatever the pattern was, and then just sort of fold up all the little pieces. We don't have to worry about getting them as small as they need to be. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, the next question here, this is from Jackie. 
And she says, when not in use, is it better to store a sewing machine with the needle in the up or down position or take the needle out? Um, my machine defaults to when it's off, the needle position is up. So if for some reason when you turn your machine off, um, your needle position is down, maybe put it up. And it, that makes sense to me too, to have it up when you're storing it so it's not down in where all the, you know, the bobbin area where all the stuff happens. You wanna keep that area clear as much as you can. So needle in the up position. Um, I always leave my needle in when I'm storing it, but I guess because I've never stored my machine for very long, just probably a couple months at a time at the most, so if you're putting your machine away for for a long time um, in storage, maybe take the needle out just so that, depending on where you're storing it, nothing rusts or you know disasters or something like that, um, so that the needle won't uh, damage anything. So yeah, long-term storage. Maybe take the needle out. I never thought of. Never had to think of that before, but um, yeah, that would make sense to me to take the needle out. Absolutely, I don't think I've ever taken my needle out before either. And I think just wherever, like you said, wherever your machine defaults to when it when you turn it off, leave it there. I have one machine that it has, you know, not needle down all the way down, but it has sort of two positions. There's, I guess, in the middle, and then there's all the way up. Um, and so, and it just sort of defaults to in the middle position too. So if you have a machine that does that. Just leave it, like you said, wherever it, it sort of wants to be, I guess. Yeah. And the um, the website with the dancewear fabric was yes. solidstonefabrics.com. And they okay. have glitter fabrics. They have knit fabrics. They have lace, sequined, tulle, mesh, velvet, all stretch fabrics, which I thought was cool. Perfect. All right. So next New Year's, you can make stuff for everybody. <laughs> just email me sure. yeah okay deal <laughs> all right next question here this is from annie when embellishing fabrics what are some things that maybe you shouldn't use that could potentially harm or break down your fabric or is there such thing when embellishing um i would just say try not to use anything that's too heavy for your fabric um so if you're embellishing like a t-shirt, I would not sew a lot of heavy beads on it because it's going to pull and um, not only stretch out your fabric, but probably pull apart the fibers of the fabric as well. Um, that is, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that might damage, uh, damage your fabric. And the only thing I can think of is if you had something on there that um, then when you needed to wash whatever right. you need, maybe wouldn't stand up well or something. Right, yeah, so. or, or something that was uh, not color fast, mm -hmm. make sure it, it can go through the wash and not lose its dye. Absolutely. All right, the next question here, Bryn says, so I have a possibly silly question uh, regarding fabric width. I'm taking a dressmaking course this year, and they tell you to bring a pattern and fabric, etc. I have a pattern, but it says that you need fabric that's 150 centimeters wide, and pretty much everything I can find online is around 110 to 114 centimeters. Am I just misunderstanding this? Why is there no wide fabric? Um, is there some secret place that you buy <laughs> wide fabric? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you have to have a special password to get in. <laughs> And a knock too at the door, I think, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, um, no. So I'm not sure the conversions from centimeter to inches, but um, in inches, most quilting cotton fabrics is 44 or 45 inches wide. Um, but there are some fabrics that are 60 inches wide. And that's typically more like um, home deck type fabrics. I know all the faux leathers that I've bought have all been 60 inches wide. Um, and for, I, I believe there are some like quilt back fabrics that come in even, even wider sizes. 
Um, but the, so the difference between the, the 45 inch wide or the 60 inch wide fabrics is from what I found at the fabric store is um, the 45 inch wide is to, you know, going to be 90% of the fabric at the store. Um, the quilting cottons and flannels and, you know, things like that. But the 60 inch wide, um, I think I may have even bought some that were 55 inches wide. Um, but that's going to be more like your home deck kind of specialty different types of, of fabric. So um, that's the difference that I found. Um, I guess if your pattern tells you to have the, the wider fabric, um, look at what fab a lot of times the, the pattern envelope will also recommend the types of fabric to use as well. So maybe it's recommending you use um, wool or, or a, a fabric that typically comes in a wider size. Absolutely. And I think, and uh, another one, since you said sort of sections of the fabric store, um, so like the special occasions sewing or yeah. fabric. Uh, I know when I, when I was making my wedding dress, I had to have the wider fabric and that's just because of how big the pattern pieces were and stuff, you definitely needed the wider fabric. So if you can't find sort of the special occasions fabric in your aisle in your fabric store, that would be something to look for um, when you're online searching as well, that for the silks and satins and those kind of things, which if you're making a dress might be what you're looking for. But yeah, that makes sense. Silks and satins typically used in wedding dresses and the pieces would be bigger. So yeah, that makes sense. All right, the next question here, this is from Hannah. And she says, what is the best size and type of hand needle and coordinating thread for hand sewing a fleece top? I have read that a size six hand needle works for hand sewing fleece fabric, but I can't seem to find the existence of size six needles anywhere. Huh. Um, Hannah, I'm sorry, I, um, I don't hand sew. So I, I'm not qualified. To answer that question, um, my entire knowledge of mach of uh, needle sizes is, you know, eighty twelve or one ten eighteen. So I'm not sure about the the size six. I, I personally don't know about yeah sizes either. Specific sizes. Um, I am kind of the same way. Like if I'm doing, I kind of avoid hand sewing if possible, and only if I'm adding beads or something, and then I go based off of the eye and kind of go through the bead. Um, so I actually just bought, and I, I can't, I'll have to find the name of it and maybe post it back on here, but it's just a little needle pack and it's a hundred hand sewing needles. And I think there's 20 to 25 different sizes in there. So I feel like if you're, if you can't find a specific size, find um, one that has a bunch of different sizes and you'll most likely be able to find um, the one you need in there. That'd be, yeah my suggestion so, all right our next question here this is from katie what is the best stabilizer to use if i want to add small blocks of embroidery to maybe strips in a crib quilt or a crib blanket um, that i possibly plan to hand quilt when i'm done um <clears throat> so when choosing a stabilizer for embroidery the the general rule of thumb um, is to match your stabilizer weight to the fabric weight that you're embroidering. So my go-to stabilizer that I always used was a, just a tear-away stabilizer. And that's kind of right in the middle of the road. So you've got your cutaway stabilizer, which is thicker and stiffer. Um, you've got your tear-away. You've got your washer, uh, wash-away or water-soluble stabilizer, which is thinner. Um, it comes in a, a very thin fabric like variety and it also comes in a film like variety a clear film then you got your heat removable stabilizer which is about the same weight as the water soluble but you use heat to remove it um, so I was always embroidering things like quilting cottons and maybe a jersey knit on occasion but um, but for all of my quilting cottons, I always used tearaway stabilizer. It was just the easiest for me to use, and it always matched my fabric weight. Um, so that's probably what I would recommend. It's nice and flexible, and 
Um, if you need to sew through it, um, you can do that, no problems. Um, it's just really easy to use. Um, after you sew your um, after you sew your design, you can either, as we were talking about earlier, you can either remove the stabilizer from the outside of the design, and with a tearaway stabilizer, the needle has sort of perforated the stabilizer around the edge of the design already, so you can just kind of tear it away, um, and it tears just like paper. It's really easy to remove. Um, or if, if for some reason you wanted to leave that stabilizer in there to stabilize the block, the actual block, um, you could do that as well um, and hand quilt right through it. Um, and I think the tearaway stabilizer uh, would stand up to washing, I believe. I would just make sure you did um, hand quilt or you know machine quilt through some you know other parts of the block because it'll probably come off from around the edge of the design a little bit during washing and you don't want the stabilizer to get kind of uh, bunched up inside your block so quilting to to um secure that absolutely all right our next question here leslie says our presser our sewing machine presser feet set to default tensions for specific fabrics? And if so, how do you test the best tension for your presser foot? It's a mouthful. <laughs> Press, yeah, the presser foot pressure is always a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, sewing machines, the, the presser foot pressure on sewing machines, uh, some machines you can alter the tension of your your presser foot some machines you can't and you can reference your machine manual to find that out um, I know there have been times in the past with my old machines I've wanted to uh, decrease the tension of my presser foot because it comes into play a lot of times when you're sewing knit fabrics your the tension can be too much it can be pressing down too hard on the fabric and that results in shifting and stretching of the knit fabric. Um, so um, in my machines, I was not able to adjust the press the pressure of the presser foot. I believe there's just a screw somewhere where you, if your machine allows you to do that, I believe there's a screw that you can tighten or loosen to adjust the, the pressure. Um, but if you cannot, there are some things that you can do um, to make sewing knits or a lot of times it came into play in velvets as well where I wanted to loosen that tension. Um, you can use a walking foot or an even feed foot, a uh, roller foot, uh, or my FOF, I have the integrated dual feed foot which comes down and hooks around the bottom of my, uh, my presser foot and acts just like a walking foot and I just, actually leave it down all the time um, and I it um, helps keep all of my layers even and everything um, so if your if your presser foot uh, does not have enough tension say if you're sewing something really thin and lightweight I have not come across that but just to give the other side of the equation if you wanted that um, tension to be more and if you could not alter it on your machine you could try um, some some tissue paper or a couple of layers even or stabilizer uh, like a tearaway stabilizer that you use for embroidery um, which could give um, the fabric a little more body um, and stability uh, and then just tear away afterward and not not cause any problems afterward it could just tear away um, but yeah most of the time whenever I have wanted to alter my presser foot pressure it has been I wanted to loosen it because it uh, typically your your presser foot um, goes down onto your throat plate with kind of a lot of pressure um, and if you are sewing fabrics that are kind of lofty um, you might want to to decrease that uh, pressure as well. 
So consult your manual to see if you are able to or type your machine um, model into your search bar and add the search terms um, presser foot pressure and see if um, anyone else has um, has done that and posted that on a forum or or if the manufacturer even has some instructions online on how to do it. Um, but yeah, using a, a walking foot um, oftentimes has alleviated that problem for me when I have wanted to decrease the tension. Perfect. And just because I don't, I don't know that I've actually even ever had a machine that allows me to do that. Is adjusting your presser foot pressure as um, intimidating as, say, adjusting your needle tension, or is it something that if you change it, do you have to worry about getting it back to normal? Um, I have actually, I haven't had to do it myself either, but I, I read a, I think it was a blog post or something, uh, someone had done it and on their machine, it was just, it was a dial like the, the thread tension dial, um, just on the top. And so it was really easy for her to adjust that and get it back to where it was previously. So um, yeah, shouldn't be an intimidating thing, but um, in this respect, especially all machines will be different, I'm sure. So it might be easy on some machines and hard on others. And on most machines, it seems completely impossible. <laughs> Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Megan. Uh, what stitch and possibly thread should I use when sewing garments that will need to cope with lots of hot water machine washing? Um, I would say if it's going to be put through a lot of washing, um, a zigzag stitch is a really good strong stitch. Um, your seams won't get pulled apart or stretched out. Um, yeah, the zigzag is a really good stitch for that. And then any special thread just because of hot water versus cold water, warm water, anything like that? Um, I would say an all-purpose thread stands up really well to repeated washings um, or a 100% polyester thread even. Um, yeah, because an all-purpose thread is just a, a cotton-wrapped polyester core thread. So it's mostly polyester, um, but yeah, 100% polyester or all purpose. They're nice, strong, they're not gonna shrink. So I would recommend that. Perfect. All right, next one here. Z wants to know if you have any advice on the best kind of fabric glue to use. Um, as far as fabric glues, um, I haven't used a lot, but when I have used them, I use Aileen's. I think Aileen's, is that the brand? Um, Aileen's? I've always said Eileen's. Eileen's? I think, is it E-I, that one E-I-L-E-E-N-S or something like that? It's the one that usually, if you shop a lot at my personal fabric store is, is Joann's, and it's usually like even in the checkout aisle, it's usually right there, easy to get. Yeah, Aileen's is A-L-E-E-N-E-S. Okay. Aileen. Yeah, and, um, they have a whole bunch of products. Sorry, I'm looking at the website right now. Um, but they started doing their bottles um, in a like a upside down kind of mm -hmm. with the cap on the bot, the cap of the nozzle on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, that was the the type of fabric glue that I had been working with, and um, they have a whole bunch of different kinds for different things. It dries fast, it dries clear uh, for the, the limited use that I have uh, of fabric glue, that's what I use. But um, for someone who uses fabric glue more, they have, you know, because that's the only kind I have used. So that is the only reason I, I recommend it. So if anyone who's watching has a recommendation for fabric glue, the best kind to use, type it in and um, we can share the knowledge. Absolutely. Now, just even though, so yours says you came in, a, it came in a bottle. Yes. 
So is that your preferred, I'm gonna say glue delivery method, just cause I know we've worked with other instructors that use spray adhesives. There's fabric glue sticks. There's obviously a bottle. I mean, is one maybe better than the other or anything like that? Um, if you want a real fabric glue, I would go with the liquid glue over a glue stick. Um, spray adhesive is kind of in its own thing. I use spray adhesive for spray adhesive applications and then glue for glue applications. I know a lot of people use a glue stick for uh, applying zippers. They use it in lieu of pins because pins can distort, you know, the, the zipper tape. Um, so I've heard of that. Um, so I guess it's depending on your your use and your application of it, what you would need. For, for the liquid glue, it's good for um, applying things like more like crafty projects rather than sewing projects. So. Perfect. All right, our next one here, this is from Susan. Um, and she says, I'm new to sewing and I'm having trouble seeing my markings of things like darts and their placements. They're either not transferring or they're too light for me to see. I've tried tracing paper, tailor's chalk, marking pencils uh, with no success. Any suggestions? Um, that all depends on what fabric you're, you're using. So I always liked using a uh, uh, tracing wheel and carbon paper and that comes in all kinds of different colors so if you're using a dark fabric use a light colored uh, carbon paper and you might have to push down pretty hard with your wheel to get the the uh, the marks to show up um, but for fabrics that my marks would not show up I always had to use tailor's tacks with like wool or velvet, you need to use tailor's tacks. Um, I always had success with tailor's tacks using a um, high contrast thread um, to mark the placements and then clipping in between the layers. Um, Just real quick, can you explain what a tailor's tack is? Because it's really not a tack. Right, no, <laughs> it's um, take a hand sewing needle and thread and you just basically, um, take a stitch in a marking and leave long thread tails. And um, if you're doing it on a double layer of fabric, then you would pull open the, the layers of fabric and clip in between so that you leave some thread in both layers of fabric. And you do the same thing if you're marking a line or you know the legs of a dart, you would just do um, like a running stitch, long stitches leaving loops long loops in between the stitches and long thread tails and um, clip the loops, then open up the layers of fabric and clip in between. Um, so if, if a tailor, if tailor's tacks for some reason weren't working, um, a water soluble or air soluble uh, pen or marker, I guess, um, makes really nice dark marks. Um, you could try that as well. Um, just make sure in your fabric that the marker will actually wash away or will actually completely disappear. Um, so yeah, the marking method really depends on um, what kind of fabric you are using. And if nothing else works, um, Taylor's Tax always worked for me. And it's, it's not as nice as having you know a drawn line on your fabric because the the threads are you know it's kind of hard to follow along the straight line so it's a little more difficult um, but you can do your your stitches like if you're trying to stitch you know the dart legs you can do your your stitches um, a little closer together so you have more thread to follow um, and then when you're done stitching the dart together, then you would, of course, have to pull all the, the thread out. So that's um, another, it's an extra step, but you know, when you're, you're trying to mark your darts on um, like a, a really thin chiffon or something that you, you don't dare, you know, put any chalk or marks or marker on, um, 
it's worth it to do Taylor's tax. Absolutely. All right, we're about at the end here. We have time for one more question. This is sort of a follow-up to, you were talking about needles before, but Rosalind says that she is not great at keeping a record of how long I've used a needle for. So when it comes to dull needles, is there anything you can tell by looking at the needle or do you just have to try it out and sew it to know whether it's dull? <laughs> yeah, um, if it's super duper dull, you can kind of touch it on your finger and uh, touch a new needle on your finger and then touch your used needle on your finger and sometimes you can tell um, If the point is not as sharp then it's time to get rid of it um, but um, Otherwise like I mentioned if you're having tension issues, it's a, a lot of times a sign of a dull, dull needle um, Or if you're getting flagging or the, the pop pop or the thud thud kind of noise when your needle goes through your fabric, that is definitely a dull needle. Absolutely, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much for being here to answer all of our sewing questions again. And of course, we will continue to do these every month. So if you maybe didn't get your question in this time or think of one you know, tomorrow, uh, either email those to us at any time. We're always available to answer your questions on our website as well as on social media, or definitely tune in next month and Nikki will be back to answer more of your questions. So thanks so much and I hope everyone has a good night. Good night.